Well, today I'm not going to dally very long because we need to move right into this afternoon's presentation, lest you're here through supper time and then you would not be pleased whatsoever. So I want to talk to you about something that really will end our conference, I think, on a very important note. Before I do that, I'll tell you a little bit about Lamb and Lion Ministries as soon as they shift gears here. Many of you are familiar with us. A few may not be. Indeed, some watching this live stream, if it was shared with you, may not understand what Lamb and Lion Ministries really is all about. We exist solely to proclaim the soon return of Jesus Christ to as many people as possible as quickly as possible. And we do that through a number of methods. We have a television program called Christ in Prophecy proclaiming the soon return of Jesus Christ. We have a radio program that launched this year and has already expanded beyond, quite frankly, our wildest dreams in short order. And for that, we praise the Lord. Some of you are familiar with our Lamplighter magazine, which comes out every other month. You can see the cover that you'll receive here in just a few weeks if you have subscribed, or if you are a prophecy partner that you'll receive automatically. And let me just say this, if you have not already joined with us as a partner, if you're watching today, I would encourage you, join with us. Be a prophecy partner to help the good news of Jesus' soon return be proclaimed far and wide. Invite us. Nathan, I, or Dave Bowen will come to your home church, even to a, a group that gathers in your home, if possible, to share that message. But the Lamplighter magazine, every other month, gives cutting-edge information and articles that will encourage and inspire you. We also take groups to Israel. Indeed, this November, we plan to go on a Footsteps of Israel, or excuse me, Footsteps of Jesus tour, although if... There's enough clamor by the group that's going. We will turn it into a Battle for Israel tour. Folks, I have a uh, feeling that every tour is going to be talking about the Battle for Israel because that continues to rage. And indeed, next year, two trips planned, one in June and one in October. Y'all come and go with us. Come join us and put yourself there at the Western Wall. Bear eye witness to what the Lord is doing in our own day and age. Is he at work? He most certainly is, and you see that when you come to Israel. So join us this year or next year in Jerusalem. Put yourself in this picture. Well, last night you heard Terry talk about, Terry Cooper, pastor from Nineveh Christian Church in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, the point of no return. Have we reached that point? As a nation, I dare say many of us feel we have. We've already gone over the edge. And if we have not already, we're right at the precipice. But what about each and every one of us individually? Well, if you haven't put your hope in Jesus Christ, we pray you're not already at the point of no return. And so that is our gospel-oriented message to share the good news that Jesus saves, that he was crucified, dead and buried for your sins and mine, but that he rose again proving that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But my message today is going to focus on nation and free fall. And my question is this, where does your hope lie this afternoon? As I get into this question, I'm going to ask you this. Do you trust yourself? Do you trust yourself? Seems like a very straightforward question, so let's approach it in a few different tangible manners. Do you trust your own eyes? Groucho Marx said, who are you going to trust, me or your lying eyes? You see, Groucho understood that sometimes our eyes mislead us. I can prove that to you. Do you think those lines are all parallel, or do they look all cattywampus to you? I can assure you they are absolutely straight and parallel. Same with these lines here. I won't leave it up too long, but lest you get a headache. But all those lines are parallel to one another. What about another example? Which of these pieces of track are longer than the other? or your eyes would give an indication that one is short and one is long, but in point of fact, they're both the exact same length, which is why a sleight of hand artist can fool your eyes all too easily. How about this picture? What color are those strawberries? They're actually black and white. There is not a smigma of color tint in this photo, nor is there any color in this photo but your eye sees it as red. Do you trust your own eyes? Some of you famously remember this dress that made uh, social media fame a couple of years ago. Well, here I've rendered it 
actually in blue and gold, but the original one that came out was one color, and yet people saw it in different shades because our eyes often deceive us. What about our ears? This parakeet's name is Rambo. He lives in Florida, and he was prone to call, help, let me out. And the police showed up, not once but twice, looking for the lady who has been uh, locked away, crying for help. And the owner had to say, no, actually, that's, that's my parakeet. Well, how about other senses we have that are so misleading? Can you tell the difference in taste between an apple and an onion? Hold your nose and take a bite of either one. You can't tell the difference. What about your sense of smell? You've heard about the man who was on his deathbed and he smelled the most wonderful odor, his favorite chocolate chip cookies, his mother's recipe handed down to his wife. So he, he crawled out of bed and hand over fist, drug himself to the kitchen and reached up for just one more cookie that smelled so delicious, upon which his wife smacked him on the hand and said, "Not those aren't for you, they're for the funeral. <clears throat> his sense of smell led him astray. I will tell you a true story. What about your sense of touch? A flying buddy of mine from my military days came home from work and found his wife cleaning the oven. He proceeded to grab her affectionately and express his undying love for her, and boy, she just felt right until his mother-in-law answered from the oven and said, well, I guess I love you too. <laughs> Boy, was his sense of touch a little off. Never quite the same relationship again with, with mom. True story. What about your heart, brothers and sisters? Do you trust your heart? Is it really what the world tells us, the wellspring of human hopes and dreams and aspirations? See, that's what we've been told over and over again. But biblically, we have been advised that the heart is more deceitful than all else. Desperately sick. Who can understand it? Nathan made the claim that Satan is the most evil person we know. I, I don't know Satan personally. I know the threats that he poses. The most deceitful person I know is me. And if you heard me when he asked, who is? I said, me because I know me all too well, and I know my own heart. As I've said before, if I haven't disappointed you yet, you haven't known me long enough. Ask my wife. We've been married for 36 years this month, and I've disappointed her and my children. I disappoint anybody, but God never disappoints. But is your heart trustworthy? Scripture says no. Well, so what is hope? I've emphasized that word over and over through this weekend because I want us to walk out of here filled with true hope. And yet the world seems to think hope is wishful thinking. Oh, I hope I get a pony for my birthday. Don't think I really want a pony. But is it that or is it what the Bible talks about, a blessed assurance? Which kind of hope do you have this morning. You know, a definition from the dictionary would say hope is a feeling or a, of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen, a feeling of trust, or in a verb sense, it is to want something to happen or be the case. A man named Alexander Pope penned a poem that you're familiar with one line, hope springs eternal in the human heart. Man never is, but always is to be blessed. It's always this elusive thing. We're looking forward to, and yet that touches on the blessed hope that is ours, not yet realized. I don't yet have the ability to put my arms around Jesus Christ or to kiss his nail-scarred feet, but I hope that I will. And that hope isn't a false hope, a, a wishful thinking. That is a blessed assurance that someday I will. Yeah. Alexander Pope got something right, even in his expectation. Here's what the world's hope is all about. Most of you have seen the Polar Express, or at least heard the, the theme song. Believe, and this is what it says. Believe in what your heart is saying. Hear the melody that is playing. There's no time to waste. There's so much to celebrate. 
Believe in what you feel inside and give your dreams the wings to fly. You have everything you need if you just believe. If you just believe. If you just believe, you have everything you need. Just believe. Believe in what? Yourself? That seems like a losing proposition. And consider that this month in particular, what is the world celebrating right now? They're celebrating one of the seven deadly sins, pride and flaunting their rebellion against God and his established order. Now, let's face it, I like the song from Polar Express. I can actually sing along with Josh Groban, not quite as good as he does. And it does what it's meant to do. It motivates people to pursue their dreams. But let's just consider if I dreamed of being an NBA basketball star, that is not a realistic dream because I am not skilled in that particular talent, nor do I have the height. So it would be a false dream. It would indeed be a lie. So do you have everything you need if you just believe, or is that what I believe it is really a lie? No, Scripture says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I believe too many in this world are going through life not just hoping for things that are promised in Scripture, but I like to think they're kind of essentially paraphrasing the old hee-haw song. If it weren't for false hope, I'd have no hope at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. False hope will only leave us with despair and eventual agony. No biblical hope is what we talk about even when we refer to a young woman's hope chest. When she knows that she is betrothed, she is engaged to a young man, and she puts things in a chest. At least they used to do that. Anybody ever have a hope chest in this room? Few of you. All right. With the promise of a wedding. Brothers and sisters, we have been promised. We are brides, so to speak. That's what Scripture called us to a bridegroom who is coming, and he is our betrothed, our beloved, and we are his. And so we look forward to being together with him forever and ever. For just a few moments today, I'd like you to consider the perspective of a man after God's own heart, a man who knew great failure, great heartbreak, but who exhibited great patience, even as he was waiting for his own anointing as king, but whose patience and waiting also pointed forward to his descendant, a promised king to come who is waiting for his final enthronement on this earth. You see, David is a man with great insight and wisdom. So let's look at what David had to say in Psalm chapter 20. Beginning in verse 1, David said, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. Are we living in a day of trouble today? Oh, yes. But you know what's ironic? The world looks at you and me sort of like Ahab looked at Elijah, and they think that you are the troublers. Anybody relish that title? I do. When applied from a biblical perspective, yes, I am in good company if the world thinks that I am a troubler. David went on in verse 2 to say, may he send you help. Uh, I, I should point out even our leaders consider you to be the problem, not the solution. Our president in 2008. Verse 2 of Psalm 20, May he, God Almighty, send you help from the sanctuary and support you from Zion. So in one verse, David identifies both the source of our salvation and the location of his dwelling place on the earth. Salvation has come from Zion through the person of no other than Jesus Christ. And when he comes to reign on the earth, he will reign from the throne of his father David on Mount Zion. And yet today, what does the world consider Mount Zion? Nice place for a mosque or a shrine. Why do you think the Muslims put their shrine? This is not the mosque, actually. It's a shrine. Why do they put this shrine and the other mosque of Omar right on the Temple Mount? The same reason they wanted to plant one at 9-11, to say, we claim victory and ascendancy. 
How many times is Jerusalem or Zion mentioned in the Quran? Exactly zero. How many times is it mentioned in the Word of God, the Bible? So many times you'd be counting the rest of the day and into tomorrow to look for every reference. No. The lies being perpetrated by Hamas and the Palestinian Authority and Hezbollah and all the other mafia leadership there in what the world calls Palestine has been accepted hook, line, and sinker by an increasingly illiterate Western world. Biblically illiterate. Well, moving on, David said in verse 3, May he remember all your meal offerings and find your burnt offerings acceptable. And this too is a messianic verse because we understand that there's no way the offerings I bring to the Lord could be acceptable in the strength of my own righteousness. All of my righteous deeds would be as filthy rags. And yet because of the blood of Christ, I have not only the, the privilege and the honor but dare I say the responsibility to come before the throne of God, lifting up praise worship as my sacrifice and every other form of, of, Lord, how can I express my gratitude for what you have done through the person of the Messiah? He's taken away my filthy rags. And as Revelation looks forward to, literally, he's given me clean white garments to wear, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Verse 4, David says, May he grant all your heart's desire, fulfill all your counsel. And this begs the question, what is your heart's desire? If I'm going to get it fulfilled, I'd like to desire the right things, wouldn't you? Well, let's look at Christ. Christ said he came down to do what? Not his own will, not his own desires, but the will of him who sent me. Do you want to be Christ-like? Do you really want to be Christ-like? Or do you just want to be Tim-like? It's an easy question. It's not, even, it's not even a no-brainer. It doesn't take half a brain to answer this one. I want to be Christ-like. Don't be Tim-like. I already told you, you'll disappoint everybody. But if you want to be Christ-like, do you want to do the will of the one who sent him and the one who has called you? You know, that's a critical question because Jesus also said, whoever does the will of my Father is, who is in heaven, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. But he also tells us in Matthew chapter 7 that everyone who calls Lord, Lord will not be in the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of the Father who is in heaven, only those will enter in. Well, Continuing on, verse 5, and by the way, all this artwork is some of my favorites from a classical age. Dave Reagan likes modern southwestern art, and his house is filled with it. It's beautiful. I like classical art by the Renaissance painters. Most of these came in the 16 and 1700s, so I have all the references if you're ever interested. But kind of an older-looking rendition of David, shall we say, coming into Jerusalem before the ark, but nevertheless, Psalm 20 verse 5, we will sing for joy over your victory, and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. So again, I ask you, what is the desire of your heart? Do you desire health or wealth or comfort or security? Because those are the things that are being threatened right now in our nation, and many are anxious because their health, their wealth, their comfort, and their security is threatened. Many in the church feel the same way. But Jesus, when he was here, although he affirmed to Pilate that he was a king, he said, my kingdom is not of this world, and I have no interest in those temporal things. Daniel himself said the Lord removes kings and establishes kings. Surely he does the same with prime ministers and presidents in our day. But neither Jesus or his apostles seemed particularly concerned about who was ruling the Roman Empire. Do we have the heart of Christ so that we love what he loves and yearn for what he yearned for? Are we dedicated to the will of our Father who is in heaven? Are we so caught up with the cares of this world that we are no heavenly good? For now, that's a rhetorical question, but you ponder that. 
Verse 6, David goes on to say, Now I know that the Lord, Yahweh, saves his anointed. He will answer from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. And again, a messianic verse because David's testimony, yes, applied to himself as the Lord's anointed in his day and age, but it also pointed forward to the Messiah who was coming. Brothers and sisters, David died and was buried. Jesus died and was buried but he rose again. The salvation David anticipated would come when? Not in his lifetime, but in God's good time. Even Isaiah understood that the Lord's anointed would be a suffering servant, pierced, crushed, chastened, and scourged. For who? For your well-being and mine, for our healing, to cover our iniquities, and to forgive our transgressions. David goes on to write, Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. So where does your hope lie today? Probably not in chariots or horses. I haven't seen too many Ben-Hur races going on lately. Eh, a few times a year at the Kentucky Derby they race horses. But how many of us are tempted to boast in our heart about our bank accounts, our portfolios, or how many people think they will stand before the Lord and, and boast in their supposedly righteous deeds. How many, even in our circles, are hoping that come November they will have something to boast about following an election? How short-sighted and short-lived are these temporal things. Now, I'll tell you, this November is important, and I hope every one of you vote, but is that where my hope lies? Well, I want to hope we, hope we make America great again. Really? That, that's it? That's all you, you got? Because those things will not last. If all those temporal things that sometimes clamor for our attention were to turn to dust and leave you with bile in your mouth, will you still boast in the finished work of Christ and what he has accomplished for you? Well, David said, they have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stood up. I love sometimes the fact that you can get insight from the pronouns in Scripture. Yes, I said it, the pronouns in Scripture. Don't be misled. But when you read Paul say, they will perish, but we will be saved. He's contrasting the world with those who have put their trust in Christ. So they is the unbelieving world who, prophetically speaking, practically have already fallen and bowed down to the wrong things. If they pass the point of no return, their fate is sealed. But we who put our trust in Christ, it's already a done deal. We have risen and stood upright through the grace of God. I love the picture, what Paul communicates in Ephesians chapter 6. Someone else mentioned it already, this full armor of God that we can take up. So what? That we can resist the evil day, including the evil one, and having done everything to stand firm. When I served in the Kentucky legislature, many of my colleagues got very nervous at times, and I would frequently cite Margaret Thatcher and say, don't go wobbly. Stand firm. You don't win battles when you leave the battlefield as soon as the enemy arrives. Appreciate what Mike Huckabee had to say. Stand our ground, because we're standing on the Word of God, and He has already secured the victory. 169 years ago, Joseph Scriven penned a hymn called, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Verses 2 and 3 begin, Have we trials and tribulations? Any of y'all have trials and tribulations? Is there trouble anywhere? Any of y'all got trouble? Oh, we got trouble. We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Any of y'all feel weak and heavy laden at times? I do. Are you cumbered with a load of care? I hope you're cumbered with the right kind of load of care for those who are lost. Precious Savior, still our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. 
Well, brothers and sisters, I can assure you of two things. If Jesus tarries, I can assure you of this. He is coming back. Guaranteed. I'm more sure of that than I am of me standing here talking to you today. And the second thing I am absolutely sure of is if he tarries, things will get worse. Oh, I don't want to hear that. Well, it's not me telling you that. That's what Scripture says. You've heard that throughout this weekend. Things will get worse. But instead of resigning myself to a season of meaningless suffering, I am excited about standing for Christ in such a time as this. Just as Paul said, that we could be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might, according to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. I'm reminded of Marine Corps General Burwell Chesty Puller. Actually, Lewis Burwell, but everybody knows him as Chesty. Most decorated Marine in U.S. history. He one time made this statement on the peninsula there in Korea. He said, all right, fellows, we're surrounded. That simplifies the problem. They are in front of us, behind us. We are flanked on both sides by an enemy that outnumbers us 29 to 1. They can't get away from us now. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we're surrounded. They're in front of us, behind us, on the sides of us. Sometimes they're even in our own churches. But here's the difference. They're not our enemy. They're our mission field. And praise the Lord, they can't get away from us now. Any direction you turn, you got somebody who needs to hear about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Which brings us to David's next passage in verse 9. Save, O Lord. May the king answer us in the day we call. Well, I feel compelled right now. I don't know who's left in this room. I don't know who's watching online or who's going to watch this DVD presentation or streaming in the weeks to come. But right now, let me take a side comment about faith as it pertains to hope. The peddlers of false gospel these days are spreading lies throughout the West and really throughout the entire world that if people lack faith, they won't be blessed. Really? That's not what Scripture says. Scripture says exactly the opposite. They said, I only need faith as small as a mustard seed. Not faith in the religiosity of my forebears. Well, you know, my grandparents, they went to church. Won't do you a bit of good. Well, we've got a church right around the corner. I, I walk in and out of there every day. You know what? I take my car in and out of the gar, uh, car wash. That doesn't make it clean forever. The temple, the temple, the temple. Is that going to be our, our mantra? Or the church, the church, the church? No. We've made that very clear. So if you have not already put your trust in Jesus Christ, here's what I have to say to you regarding calling on the Lord this day. Today is the day of salvation. Right now is the acceptable time. You know what? Jesus may come tomorrow, but you may die tonight. So don't tell me I'm going to wait and see what happens because you're not promised another hour or another day. Those of you all gathered here today, I hope everybody gets home safe and sound, but you're not promised to get home from this gathering in Denton, Texas. Don't wait to put your trust in Christ. If you need to yell right now, we'll stop this service and we'll do some eternal business. And if you want to wait just to the end of this presentation, well, you're taking about a 10-minute risk. But come talk to me because you can't afford to wait. Folks, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that great hope in a lie is like saying a million times zero. It still equals zero. But all it takes is a little bit of hope in an infinite, true, and loving God. And what do I get if I multiply one, just one? How about if I multiply just point one or a hundredth of, a, of one times infin infinity? I still get infinity. So if I have faith the size of a mustard seed, Scripture says that's all it takes. God will do the rest, and He will sprout that tiny mustard seed, some of them are even smaller than that, into a tree that will bear fruit in its kind and will testify to living faith. How big is your faith, your hope, your love? 
Perhaps the question should be, how big is your God? Big enough? Mine is infinitely big. Well, John chapter 6 records that Jesus shared some difficult truths about himself, about the gospel, with the Jews around Galilee, and many of them grumbled. They even withdrew, choosing not to walk with him anymore, just as Terry warned us about last night. He asked the twelve, if they would continue to follow him. And Peter understood the choice that was being represented, so he responded and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You, only you, have the words of eternal life. He knew what the Holy Spirit had revealed to him and to every person who has trusted in Jesus Christ. And in Peter himself later testified at Pentecost, we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God a man who'd lived his life, reminded every morning of his failure. You think you're reminded of your failures? How'd you like to be awakened every morning with a reminder of your greatest failure? You think Satan was trying to needle in on Peter? But God's grace was sufficient, and Peter was bold in his faith and not weakened even by Satan's efforts to undermine his confidence in Christ. We know that you are the Holy One of God. Now what Satan offers is false hope. What God offers is true hope. But he also makes it very clear that while we wait, there's some things that he is working together for our good and his glory even in this time. And that's why Paul could write that we glory in our sufferings. I don't look forward to suffering, but I realize it's for God's glory. Why do I glory in suffering? Because I know that suffering produces perseverance, the same thing y'all have exhibited this afternoon, and perseverance, character, y'all are all got good character, I know, and character, hope. Oh Lord, don't send any suffering my way. Well, if I want to grow in trust for the Lord God, it's sort of like Job. It wasn't Satan's idea to test Job. It was God's idea. Because God knew what Job could endure, and God knew the plan he had to restore Job after Job's faith was proven to himself and to Satan. Job grew through his suffering to demonstrate perseverance, character, and hope. Well, Paul also says that we should rejoice in hope, be patient in little t tribulation, and be constant in prayer. Do you take everything to your friend in Jesus in prayer? I hope and pray that you do. What about the prophet Micah? Micah said, but as for me, I watch. How does he watch? In hope for the Lord. I wait for the God of my salvation. He will hear me. Are y'all waiting for the Lord? You're here today about a, a prophecy conference to hear a message of hope. We are all waiting on the Lord. But do you continue to watch in hope while you wait? Is your hope spring eternal? Not because that's the nature of man, as Alexander Pope says, but because as a Christian, we know the person who is our blessed hope. We don't hope in hope any more than we have faith in faith. Our hope is in the person of Jesus Christ and in the sureness, the yes and amen of every promise he's made to you and to me and all the other promises of Scripture which he will keep. He, our Savior, hears us and cares for us. For this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he has seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it, how? With patience. I know that's hard. I've said it before, I can't wait till I have patience. I just, I'm looking forward to the day. But God is teaching me patience because I wait upon him, I wait for him, and I do so with hope. You saw this picture before 
And I cited the verse, but really, I believe that this verse could be read in this manner. Dare I add to the words of Scripture? But I think this is what is implied. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, yes, the conviction of things not yet seen. Why? Because we will see them. We will see Christ with our own eyes. We will see him descending from the heavens to take up the throne of his father David on Mount Zion. But I haven't seen it yet. And so my hope is looking forward with great anticipation to that glorious day. I may not have seen it already yet, but I know that that promise will be fulfilled to me and to all who have put their trust in him. Well, this brings me to a reminder that was driven home to me very recently as my daughter graduated from college in Louisville, Kentucky. And as we watched a wonderful ceremony and saw all these young people streaming across the stage to receive their diploma, there was a young lady who was graduating in her class who was blind. And for the four years she was at this school, she would just head out in the morning and somebody, just whoever, one of the other students would, would take her arm and lead her around and they would chat and become friends. And that day there was a couple that were actually designated to, to help her. And she walked with great joy and excitement, not able to see one bit of where she was going. All she could do was trust that that escort was going to lead her along a safe path, avoiding obstacles, avoiding places that she could trip, unlike Tommy Nelson earlier, and take her up to the stage to receive her diploma, and then escort her off the stage and back to where she could sit with her friends. She didn't have one doubt that her escort was going to take her faithfully to where she needed to go. Brothers and sisters, we grope in this life virtually blind to what lies ahead. But if you put your hand in the hand of Jesus Christ, you can step boldly and confidently and faithfully even into an unknown future, unknown in the short term, fully known in the eternal term, because if your hand is in his, he will not let you stumble or fall because he knows the plans he's made for you and he knows the, the place he's prepared for you and he will keep you and preserve you. Jesus indeed is coming soon and very soon. Perhaps before this hour or this day is over. I'm ready. Are you? Are you looking forward to his coming? Are you so eager to see him you can just, in your mind's eye, imagine it right now? You know, the kind of tough faith we're talking about is the faith exhibited by Daniel. But he said of the end times that in the end times, the people who know their God will display strength and take action. What action can we take? If the question was asked earlier, the action is to go home, to write 10 letters to people you know. We already gave you that assignment. To tell everyone you can, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. You don't have time to mess around anymore. Do you know him? Do you know the Lord and Savior who loves you more than I can possibly express? David wrote in Psalm 7, Lord, what do I do? For what do I wait? And then he affirmed in his word of testimony, my hope is in you. So my benediction to you, before we sing a word, our song of praise, is straight out of Paul's letter to the church at Rome. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Maranatha and Godspeed.